guess uh, many of you did have questions regarding to the cloud and all. So yes, we can take up this question later on. And yes, so today our focus is mainly on Windows and Linux. So I have not separated the topics because both are operating systems. And we will see both the operating systems as a comparison of each other. So you'll be able to relate more nicely how the both operating system functions and when you should select which operating system, what are their benefits. So first of all, when we discuss about Linux and Windows, the first question that pops up to our mind is that, which is better? So the answer that you always have to this is, depends upon what you want to do. So what is your, you can say, what is your application that you want to configure? What is the application or what is the project that you want to use it for? So the as your use case changes, so will your decision to use which operating system would also change. So when it comes to the decision making, yes, there will be several factors that you need to factor in. Everything comes into play. That's from your cost to the application support, licenses, etc. So there are many factors that you need to factor in before you make a decision of what operating system you should use to host your application. Now, during the last session, when we were discussing virtualization, we also discussed the operating system and how it abstracts the layer for the application, where we can run applications independent of any underlying hardware. So this is what your Windows or Linux will do. It will give you that layer of abstraction where you can run any application. But this, again, comes with a catch. You cannot have Windows applications running on a Linux machine. Likewise, you cannot have Linux applications working on a Windows machine. Now, why is that so? That's because of the underlying libraries that are available to the application. So those libraries differ according to the operating system or the applications that you install on the particular operating system. They will never be the same. It always differs. There are, however, some cross-platform applications available. So like we discussed, we do have Java. That is uh, very cross-platform. It runs not only on Windows and Linux. It also runs on your Android. It also runs on Macintosh. So it's a truly a cross-platform application. That way, you mostly see uh, applications that are developed and especially with needs to be cross-platform are developed in Java. Now we'll come back to the topic at hand. We will see, uh, we'll start with Windows. So that's more fairly easy to understand. Then we move on to Linux. Now what we will discuss over here is why Windows? What are its benefits? What are the pros, cons? And then again, we'll do the same thing for Linux. So we will do it mostly a comparison. Now, this topic is not within our curriculum, but yes, I will take an additional topic over here. I will go to Azure and create a new Windows machine. So I'll also give you a walkthrough along with seeing a Windows machine. So as soon as I go to create a resource, I have several options. Windows Server. So this is a Windows Server Data Center edition. And you have Ubuntu Server. This is your Linux Server. Linux servers come in several flavors. You'll we'll see that a bit more in detail. So before I do that, I'll just take a generic compute. Compute is basically a virtual machine. To create a virtual machine. For AWS, so when you have an AWS session, the trainer at that time will walk you through AWS, and how you can get a free subscription as well. So I'm using a free subscription form Azure. This helps me identify for what I've created this particular machine. I can have it look hosted on any location in the world. So I've selected East US. I could actually even take India. I'll let it be East US. It doesn't matter the location.
So I'm not going through all the options because that's not a part of the training. Okay, so the option what I wanted to show over here is this particular option, the operating system that I can have installed. So I have Windows Server, I have Windows 10. Then I have several other OSs listed over here. You can see you have Ubuntu Server. So this is a flavor of Linux. You have Ubuntu Server 18. So that's an older version of Linux. Then you have Suzy Enterprise Linux, another flavor of Linux. So Linux comes with several flavors depending upon from where it has forked the a kernel. So the main kernel is still by Linus, who is maintaining the base Linux kernel. Over that, you have several contributors who create their own versions. When it comes to Suzy or Red Hat, these are two enterprises that have that provide in, uh, Linux as an enterprise scale. They have a dedicated team of developers and they also provide you support. Another thing good with Linux is that it's completely open source. So any of the code that is developed is available on the repositories online. Nothing is hidden. You can compile your complete OS just by downloading the source code and installing the requisite packages to have it compiled. So nothing is hidden from you. Nothing is kept secretive. You can completely build it. The only catch that they have, that is the only statement that they share is that please give the credits back to the contributors who have contributed to mention their names whenever you're rolling out or using their piece of code. So that's the only statement that is shared by the Linux developers. The enterprise editions, yes, they are paid. They are also open source, but you will not get the latest source code available immediately because they are paying for it and they are maintaining, they are charging their customers for that. So the source code is not immediately available, but yes, it, it is made available a bit delayed. It depends on the architecture of the enterprise. Because it's open source code Linux, so they are mandated to share the source code at a given point in time. So they will do that, not sooner, but later they do share. Apart from that, you have Oracle Linux, Debian, CentOS, now coming back to Windows, Windows, you can see we have Windows Server Data Center, Windows Server 2019, Windows Server 2016, and then you have Windows 10 Pro. Windows 10 Pro is a desktop edition, whereas the server editions, you can see they are clearly called out Windows Server. Now, since I'm open this on the cloud base, I only have the option for the data center editions because this is hosted in a data center. Now, yes, this will be a virtual machine. This will not be a physical machine that will be given to me. This will be a virtual machine that will be created. Apart from the data center editions in Windows Server, you have the standard edition. Uh, previously, you used to have also the enterprise edition and web edition. So they are mostly taken out. Now you have only the standard edition that is a small subset of your data center edition. It has all the features, but yes, it's a uh, limited a uh, bit on the number of resources it can provision. And also it limits the scale of the server. That is you have limitation on the RAM and the CPU that you can utilize it with. Above that, you need to have a data center edition. Also the standard edition comes a bit cheaper because of those limitations, whereas data center is a bit more expensive compared to the standard edition. And then you have is your desktop edition. So that is what you'll be more familiar with. So that is the operating system on your desktop. Now, why is this available on the cloud? So this is mainly available for people who want to do testing and do not have admin access or do not have full access on their local machines where they require to do testing maybe in a particular region, from a particular region, using specific desktop tools that may not get installed on a Windows server. Now you see, I'm also telling there that within Windows, across the server editions, you cannot have certain softwares installed and deployed. So there are such restrictions because may, this mainly comes because of the licensing. 
Windows Server license generally supports multi-user, whereas Windows 10 is meant for a single user only. That's the reason there's a licensing difference and the way the software works between the two. So when you see a Windows 10 or you now currently you have a Windows 11 that is going on. So they are meant only really for a single user or desktop user who will use end user uh, applications. So you will mostly not be hosting virtual machines. You will not be hosting a website or any sort of application that caters to multiple people. You will generally only run applications that would cater to a single person, a single entity. It could be your web browser, it could be office apps, it could be any application that is meant for a single user. That application may connect out to various other applications that is not limited. But yes, but the desktop edition is meant to be used by an end user. The server editions are consumed by multiple people. Now, again, now the licensing concepts comes place over here. The server edition is licensed both on the number of cores that you have, the CPU cores, plus you also need to declare the number of users who would be accessing the server. So again, that adds to your cost. Microsoft calls this as CALS. This is known as client access license. So I will go and create a 2019 data center edition server. I'm taking 2019, I'm not taking all the latest one that's 2012. I'm yet not familiar with it. Sorry, 2022. Uh, 2016 is too old, so it's going to be depreciated. Yes, so when I say too old, every software has a life cycle. The European Union mandates every software needs to be fully supported for five years and an extended support for security for an additional five years. So every support that every OS or every software that is launched is mandated to have this type of support. So, and especially these being enterprise applications, they are also governed by this type of support. For Windows, we can quickly see So when you're de deciding on Windows, you need to know also when you're deciding on which Windows edition you need to go with. Along with the cost, you also need to ensure that your operating system will remain supported till the end of your project or at least till a reasonable time that you intend to use your application. Okay, so I was looking for a good table that shows actually till when the software is supported. Okay, so it gives you a, a servicing timeline. So that's 36 months. And then you have 24 months. So like we discussed, it's five years. So you have five like five years of servicing timeline. So during this time, you will get both features and also security updates. And after that, you have extended five years where you get only security updates for your operating system. Okay, I don't see that ready chart, but yes, so that is a life cycle policy. Let's see, there's a policy that clearly. Okay, so there's a separate page as you see on Microsoft that shows us all the life cycles when it is ending and ready reference what all are ending in 2022. So, again, a list of softwares that are going out of support. end of servicing means there will be no services and there will be no support as well provided by microsoft if you come with any of these applications or the operating system 
So this has both for the applications as well as operating systems. Similarly, you also have it for Linux. Now Linux comes with flavors. So now you need to check this for that particular flavor. So I'm looking for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It's the same thing that we discussed. It has full support for 5.5 years. So nearly six years. Then after that, it has maintenance support till the end of 10 years. After that, if required, there is extended support also gives power shared, but that could be ended at any time. So most of the operating system, you'll see they follow the same cycle. Five years, you'll get full features. And after that, the next five years, you will just get maintenance support. They will give you critical bug fixes or just security updates. They do not give you the full-fledged support. Okay, this is for Red Hat Enterprise Linux version 8. Okay, it has the maintenance supposed to 10 and another additional two years of extended life phase support. The more details as you scroll down the page. So these are all open documents available on the internet. So you can just browse on the internet and see the life cycles. Coming back to creating the machine. We put in the credentials using which I'll be able to access the machine. Okay, so I don't need to see any other options. Okay, so now this will review and start to create the operating system, the machine for me. You can see the cost associated over here. So now, since this is not a specific training, so I've not walked you through all these steps of getting the machine created. Just go ahead and trigger the creation now this will take a couple of minutes so it will uh, like we discussed during the virtualization training again i'll refer to that so this will use an ready-made image and get it provisioned it doesn't take more than a couple of minutes so we should be able to access it soon okay. so meanwhile i'll also, also go and create a linux machine so Linux, I will use a free edition. I'll use a free edition that is of CentOS. Ubuntu also is free, but I'm more comfortable with the Red Hat versions. And CentOS is a derivative of Red Hat that has most of the features of Red Hat and has a similar command. So because of that, I will take a CentOS. You can take Ubuntu also. That is also fine. The kernel is the same. But there's a slight difference on how the package is managed. Now, again, the question would come like, why I'm saying Linux, why is the difference between how CentOS and Ubuntu is managed? Just, just because the package managers or the developers working on them have taken a different approach to maintain the OS. And, and that's been a very long time back. And since then, it has grown a lot. And that has been followed standard for the OS. So Linux has been more liberal on how it can be configured. And being open source, obviously, everything has been shared across everyone. 
so it has never limited anybody from making their own choices so now again the linux os is which i mentioned they are the mainstream leading operating systems apart from these there are several distributions of linux available so they are also known as flavors they are meant for specific purposes many of you may have heard of kali linux that is mainly meant for your penetration testing for security purposes people use so that is another flavor of a linux operating system so it depends on the developer depends on the person who is customizing it they have the full freedom to create and maintain as they want apart from that you have the major oss that like red hat suzy then centos ubuntu and several others that are managed by a community of users and they receive regular updates and are maintained constantly now linux does not have a separate concept of call as server or you have a desktop it everything depends on the packages that you install on it you and then you designate whether you want it to be a server or you wanted to use it as a desktop now again when it comes to linux it's totally free there is no licensing associated on it there may be some software that you use that you would have to pay for for example i can uh, say that maybe some antivirus software generally people do not put antiviruses on linux but yes you do get antivirus software that run on linux especially for server editions you would want to secure it with an antivirus then uh, also there are specific software such as nginx so that's another web server you have both the free edition and the paid edition from the vendor where you can install it on your linux servers the free edition uh, does not come with a uh, support from the vendor whereas the paid edition you can subscribe for support from the vendor where they'll help you configure and fix any issues that you face with the web server many features like this you can get for both free and paid so my windows machine is provisioned you must have seen the prompt that came over here the notification it's already provisioned and ready to access before that i'll just quickly go and create my linux machine i'll prefer to have it created I'll select the same location. On the next, I can go as small as I want. Okay, so now we were discussing about costs. We can see over it says sent over seven minimal. I would pay additional three rupees for licensing. So now Linux. Now since this is maintained by a separate vendor, that's why it involves a separate cost. So like we discussed, though Linux is free, but you can be charged by vendors for their services, for their packages that they have, or the efforts they have put in. So I will change the operating system. I will not use this paid one. So this will be an additional cost to me. Change the operating system. Once again, I will review. Okay, so you see now the additional charge that had come of three rupees has gone away. I only have the machine ex charges. go ahead and get the machine created meanwhile 
So I don't need to wait. I can go back to my Windows machine and log in. Deep. I have one question regarding the charges. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so the charges will vary according to the machine uh, or the VM or the uh, means additional uh, server loads, right? So if, if uh, one specific load was added, suppose there are multiple users are using uh, that per specific ways or uh, subscribers. So then the charges will go on increasing the specific uh, machine adding process. Uh, it depends on the config of your machine and then the licenses that you purchase with it. So that's how your charges will vary. So that will be covered in more detail like when you're doing your Amazon topic. So the charges, how it is calculated depends on several factors, uh, especially in a cloud. Okay. So, and then you also have the licenses. So all those would be mostly covered in your, yeah, with the hardware respective, it will be covered in your Amazon class. Uh, so. Now, since we are seeing that over here, I'll just give you a brief. So when I create a Windows machine with the same configuration, when I say same configuration, it would be the size. So this determines your cross primarily when you're going to the cloud. So this is two CPUs, 8 GB RAM, a window that took a higher memory because Windows has the GUI and it would take more, it would consume more memory. So that's why I took more memory over here. Whereas for Linux, I took just one CPU and two GB. So you see yeah. the huge cross difference. I was just paying one rupee something for an hour, whereas for Windows, I'm paying six rupees something. So ideally, it's just a double of the Linux, or you can say four times. So actually, it should have been something at four rupees. But since it's Windows, so I also need to pay the licensing cost. So that's why the cost is a bit more at the higher side when it comes to Windows compared to Linux. OK, yeah. thank you. Welcome. So I will connect to the machine. So whenever you connect a remote Windows machine, I remember this is your server operating system. So it will always mainly be hosted in a data center or it will be on your cloud. So you would always remotely connect to it. So there are many ways to remotely connect. Again, that will be covered within your AWS session. I'll just give a brief overview that you have VPN. You would generally not connect over the open internet. I'm collect connecting right now is over an open internet. Now, again, these all concepts, I'll be also taking your networking class. So keep in mind all these things I'm telling now, I will again be referencing it when we are dis discussing networks. So it's a part of that. So this is a public IP. More details will come in that class. So this public IP is accessible from anywhere in the world. You can note down this public IP, open your remote desktop connection, go to start, type remote, as you open your remote desktop connection and you put in this IP, the IP that is 20.39.35.182, you also will be able to access the machine. This machine is accessible from anywhere, everywhere. I've not restricted who can access it. Those restrictions also can be put in. But I will take that networking a bit when we are doing the networking class. So I won't go in deep over here, but can be restricted. Right now, I can just access it with the IP. So when you hit enter, it will give you the prompt to login. Now I've created my own credentials to login over here. You do not have the credentials, so you will not be able to log in. You will only get the login prompt. So the object is not for you to log on to this machine. If you will log in, I will lose my session. So how Windows works is that your server edition works. It allows multiple users to access it. Accesses could be on several means. It could be maybe through your uh, browser. You can access a website that's hosted on it. or you could access a particular port or an application that is running on it. So there are a lot of uh, features like this available. Or if there are several ways you can access it, it does not limit you how you can connect to your machine and work on it. Yeah. 
So this is your first look when you come on to a Windows Server machine. You always have the server manager that will log start up when you first time log in. Okay, so you can read the security prompt. A similar security prompt also comes on your Windows machine whenever you connect it to a new network. On a server, you will mostly tell no. You do not want it to be accessible or anybody to know that this server exists. And especially since I've launched it on a cloud, I want to keep it more secretive. A new part that has been launched in the new edition of Windows Server is a new way to manage your server, that Windows Admin Center. And this is a separate installation that you need to install on the older editions of Windows Server. I'm using a 2019, so it is asking me if I want to install and manage to it. Not mandatory, you still have the server manager. Now, what is your server manager? Your server manager will basically give you the interface to work on your server where you can add the specific roles to better utilize your server. Now, mostly what you will use your server is for hosting an IS website. That is your .NET code. Or it could just be a simple HTML code also. But you would mostly use for .NET web applications to be hosted on your Windows web server. Before we go ahead, I'll just show you the task manager. So when we were doing the virtualization training, we did discuss about this, that Windows and nowadays the modern operating systems are virtualization aware. We can see over here, when I go to the task manager, it clearly says this is a virtual machine. So you know now I'm using a virtual machine. So the machine is aware that it is a virtual machine and it will not perform the tasks that a normal operating system would perform with respect to the hardware. The hardware maintenance and all would be done by the host operating system. All you would, all this virtual, virtual machine would be doing is that it would do the primary functions for what it would be configured. It would not do the hardware maintenance part. It would skip those generic parts. So now coming back to your Windows Server, we'll discuss a couple of roles and how to get them installed and configured. So you have two options whenever you work on a Windows Server. You can install it a role-based or feature-based installation. So that is the most common option that you would do on a virtual machine. Or you could use a VDI. So this will again create a virtual machine-based a session based desktop environment. What does this mean is that you can have several users who would log on remotely to the machine to their own individual space and then work on that machine directly. We do not want that. So I'm looking for users to access this machine remotely and not locally. Okay, so now which all servers now again Windows Server has a feature where you can do the same task or activity onto several machines at the same time. Now, since I have only one machine over here, I'm going to configure this activity or this task on this one machine itself. Server roles. There are several server roles available, predefined roles available on a Windows server to get started with. So if these roles do not specify, do not uh, meet your needs, you can definitely install custom application as well on these. But mostly you would be using one of these server roles to get for on the Windows server. Now, what could be a custom application? Maybe uh, you are into using web applications such as, say, a collaboration tool such as uh, SharePoint, or maybe you want to use a database engine such as SQL Server. So that would be a more specific uh, 
custom application that you want to install and get it configured on your Windows Server environment. Apart from these applications, you also have more features that you can have configured onto your Windows Server. Now, another more common feature that you would configure is your .NET Framework. The .NET Framework features give the framework features enabling in your web server. We will see the web server. I'm just giving an overview of what all features that are available. So yes, definitely we'll not have time to go through all these features. Or uh, just an overlook of what all features are available. Depending on your scenario now, you may not even enable or use all these features. There may be very specific features that you may get configured and used. That's why I specified the two main ones, .NET Framework with something we that would generally be enabled onto an Windows server when we are hosting a Windows web server, that is your IS. Your main concentration will be on the server roles. The server roles you can see where we have, first of all, is the Active Directory services. This is your Microsoft LDAP service for authentication. We all log in to Learning Mate Move. So that is your Active Directory services provided by the Learning Mate ET team. So whenever you put in your credentials, it always tells you to specify Learning Mate Move slash your username. So that's the Active Directory services that's configured by the Learning Mate IT team. And that provides authentication for your machines. Our machines actually. Anything that you will want to log into, anytime you want to log in, it will always prompt you with Learning Mate. Okay, so if I try to connect my machine, also first thing it tells me Learning Mate Moom. So that's the domain name that it tries to connect to. We're not going deep into that, so we do not have as much time to take the full service. But yes, just giving you an overview of what you can do. DHCP and DNS server. DHCP server provides IP on your network. DNS server provides domain name resolution. We will see this up both in depth during the networking session. So my networking again will be focused on the cloud. So yes, we will visit this part again. File storage services. Yes, an interesting one you'll see over here. I also have an Hyper-V. So we discussed during our virtualization training that Hyper-V is the hypervisor that is available on windows server operating system that is available on your windows operating system not just windows server you can also have it on your windows 10 operating system and you also have it on your windows server operating system now you will say that okay I've, during the last class we'll discuss that on a virtual machine you will not generally install an other hypervisor see this is the reason windows has an inbuilt capability that it will check whether your machine is capable of running VMs or not. Now, since I'm already using a virtual machine, it does not allow me to configure the Hyper-V role. So I cannot get it configured itself. Hence, I cannot use the Hyper-V role on my this Windows machine. So this is another benefit of using your virtualization aware machine, it will not allow you to further create virtual machines in them. Now, you may say this comes as a limitation, but like we discussed, so there is no much benefit of running VM within a VM. So the overhead becomes too much. So rather than having a VM within a VM, you would create a virtual machine on the main host and use it for the purpose that you intend. But you would never create a VM within another virtual machine. So that overhead becomes too much and it's not worth the expense at the CPU and RAM that would get consumed. So it's not, that's why it's generally avoided. But yes, you can install, say, a virtual box or any third party virtualization software on it. It would not be able to use the full extend of the virtualization so nothing stops you from putting a virtual box or any other third party virtualization software on the os and run your virtualization but then the same thing same discussion comes into play that it actually does not give you any added benefit over the cost over the 
uh, operating system that you're already running. So you would generally avoid that. The most common role now you would configure over here is your web server. Now, another thing you would have noticed when I just select one tool, it adds a host of tools within that. And also it gives me an option to add management tools. So Microsoft tries to make it very easy. Yeah, so Windows is from Microsoft and other major IT player. Microsoft provides both support as well as the operating system, so both the product that it sells. So along with the operating system, you can also purchase support from Microsoft where they help you resolve any issues that you face on your operating system during the support tenure. Now I've added the feature, remember, in the web server. I'll just take some common things that are easy to configure and quick. The one is your web server that's most commonly going to be used. Fax server, fax is now mostly depreciated, not much people use. But yes, some people do make use of it, so you would still have the option on the operating system. Another thing, when you click on a particular service, you can see the description. So you don't need to buy out what these services or go and search on the internet what service you want to get installed and configured. So this does give you a brief description of what this service does. Now, all these services, even I haven't personally made use of. So maybe some organization does make use of the individual services. So I do not know what is uh, post guardian service, never made use of that. But as it says over here, it helps enable guarded host to unlock and run shielded virtual machine. So along with having Hyper-V configured, you can have this additional layer of host guardian service that provides more isolation between the virtual machines that are hosted on a particular Hyper-V host. Now this virtual machine that we have connected to is a Hyper-V guest. Another way to find out whether it's a guest or a host is to check the services that are enabled. So one way we can easily come to know is through your task manager. So that definitely tells you whether it's a virtual machine or it's a physical machine. And the second way would be by coming to your services console and see the Hyper-V tasks that are activated. So you can see you will find the guest task specifically running. If the Hyper-V service itself is not there, but the guest tasks are enabled and running within the operating system. And this is again with respect to Windows. So we already discussed the Hyper-V role. So this is what will provide you the virtualization capabilities. Now I cannot show you the Hyper-V console, but I will show you the tool through which we can manage the Hyper-V uh, console. So we have the network controller, network policies, print and document services, remote access. Yes, another one common role that is configured is our remote desktop services. So by default, your Windows server would allow three simultaneous logins. Yes, that's the number is three, one on the console and two remote users. The three people can simultaneously connect like this remote desktop to a machine and work at the same time. If you need more users to log in, so when we were selecting the server selection, the installation type, we seen the VDI option. So at that time, you need to have remote desktop services enabled. The remote desktop services will allow n number of users to connect to your machine. The reason I say n is that you it's not unlimited. It's definitely limited by your CPU, the RAM, the resources on the host machine. So it's not never an infinite, infinite number. It will always be an n number that would be determined by the CPU, RAM, and also the application that you intend to run. So the same application where 10 people can run simultaneously, it could be just only another application. One person could use on one machine at a time. 
So completely depends on the application as well. Now again, any of the services that you use over here, they again have licenses associated with it. Many of the licenses are built within your operating system itself. So you don't need to pay additional, but a couple of several services do require additional licenses, like the remote desktop service would require additional licenses per user who are going to connect to the machine. Same thing for your web server. You need to have licenses purchased depending upon the number of users that would be connecting to the machine. So apart from the base OS, you need to pay user access licenses as well. Then you have the deployment services. Again, now these services are used by the IT team for provisioning your machines, a custom image. So hopefully Learning Mate would have a custom image. They wouldn't go and install the operating system, then install one one setup that is required by the organization onto the machine. They would make use of the deployment services where they would configure all that needs to be deployed onto your machine and just provision your machine using this service. The last service over here is your update services. This is another feature given in all Windows servers using which you can control the updates that are being pushed to your machines. How does that work is that you specify, you update what updates that need to be deployed into your network. And this will have those updates made available to those particular machines. So this is another more, more advanced topic. We will not go again into depth. All of these are actually very advanced topics. But yeah, just an overview of what all things we can do. We will see the web server because the web server is fairly easy to configure and easy to understand how to see and configure that. Now, remember another thing, I'm doing this via the GUI. I also have an option of doing all these steps using PowerShell. So PowerShell is the Windows native tool that is the CLI tool available on Windows. Now, once again, I'm also taking your Windows PowerShell session, so I'll be going more in depth over there. So I'm not going to discuss Windows PowerShell over here right now. There's a separate session for you also for shell scripting. So at that time, again, you will be taught how to write shell scripts, how to execute them. So that is mostly from the coding side. So today we'll see again a basics of shell uh, commands that we will use to install and configure some roles onto the machine. So this is your PowerShell interface. Now, since I'm using the server edition, I straight away start with the administrator PowerShell. Whereas on your desktop, you will have to right click onto your PowerShell and run it as an administrator. Now, since I'm directly on a Windows machine, so it says administrator and then the Windows PowerShell because I'm running it as an elevated shell directly on the Windows server. We'll come back to that. Now, looking at the features, I'm not selecting any features over here, just leaving it default. Yeah, there are a lot of features, so you can select them and read what are the features going to do. Many features listed over here. Windows PowerShell, as you see, is a feature. It has installed Windows PowerShell 5.1. I think the latest PowerShell is 7 right now. Not sure of that, but yes, it has the Windows PowerShell 5.1 over here. Several other services. I'm not going to in depth into them. Okay, so we have selected the IS role to be installed. So this is going to install the IS 10 version. The previous version, so depending upon the operating system that you select you'll get a different version of IS. So if your application is built and requires a particular version of the application to work on, so you, sorry, so you need to have that particular version of the operating system to install. So now your, your one of your questions would be answered, which operating system I need to select. So now 
if you are going to host a web application, your developer would tell it would run on which version of IS, which version of ASP.NET. So that is the two things that you need to match and then deploy the application onto that server. Mostly IS is backward compatible. So is your .NET framework. So until you have a later version of both IS and .NET framework, your application should run fine. But there could be some challenges if some particular feature of IS would be depreciated and your application is making use of it. Yes, then definitely there would be an issue. So you need to match that and accordingly have your operating system installed and configured. Next, now this is the roles that I'll be configuring. So you see, although I just selected one role in the feature, in the server roles, it has selected so many roles. Now again, these roles would depend upon your application that you're planning to host. This is a default selection. So this does not even select your .NET framework. So if you see application development, .NET framework is right now not enabled for this IS website. So you need to select over here. When you select this, it also adds the features of .NET framework. So the features, I did not make any selection, but Windows will automatically configure the dependencies. So these are the dependencies to have the feature configured. You do not need to be concerned of all the dependencies. Microsoft will resolve that by itself and add those dependencies. I'll just go and click add features. Now, if I go back to features, yes, I can go back. I'll scroll up and see .NET 3.5. You can see 3.5 is now selected to be installed. So either I do it first over here in the features or I come over here and select it does not make a difference. So either ways, it will go ahead and configure the .NET framework to install. Okay, so sometime it may require a restart. When you're installing your role, you can check this option. It will automatically reboot the server after the required roles are configured. But this role does not require a restart. I will say no and I'll remove the restart check and I will press install. You can verify before you click install what all things are being installed, what all things are going to be configured. So this will take a couple of minutes to get configured. So not that quick. Okay, so we are almost to the end of our session. So yes, we have a second session that we'll be continuing today at 2.30. There we will see Linux. So any questions so far while our machine is getting configured? Yes, Sandeep. Uh, yes. I have one question. So like uh, here we are using uh, like Azure platform, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we saw some uh, features are available in AWS, like uh, tree tearing. So is this so on, like we present on Azure also? Oh, uh, sorry, which uh, feature you are talking about? Uh, uh, tree tier. That means like some for particular some uh, period or like. Yes, like, correct. Uh, I'm making use of the free tier only. Really. So you see, I'm not going to pay for the subscription, right? <laughs> so it's not a uh, company paid either. So I'm making use of the free tier only. And uh, that is where I have created the VM. So now as soon as the session gets over, I'm going to go and delete all of it. So that does not consume my free tier of uh, resources. Okay. So, okay, here so like, now, yeah. Yeah. So you also can go and register. The, so apart from now, what AWS does, it gives you a free tier and limits your resources. What Azure does, it gives you a free tier that will be for one year. Plus, it also gives you a credit of $200. In Indian currency, it comes to around 13,300 rupees. So you can, and that is meant for one month, where you can play around with any of its premium services and you will not be billed for it. So this is something that AWS does not give where you have to be very cautious with your cost. Whereas Azure gives you that freedom 
for the first month it's completely on the house means up to the limit of 13300 you can track how much you are consuming and then accordingly uh, utilize whatever premium resources you want it's not going to stop you beyond the free resources okay of the one year that has been given to you for the first month you can go completely unlimited okay. to the higher cap of 13300 in india or 200 dollars so whatever is equivalent yeah really good thanks thanks yeah so that's the reason you see i open azure because had i been on aws i could launch either a windows vm or a linux vm because it my ec2 and my ec2 compute is restricted to uh, i think 720 hours a month and up to 30 gb of storage so if i create two vms i need to provision two 30 gb of storages that go beyond my uh, limited or uh, called my free limit so the extra 30 gb if i create a second vm that gets a charge okay so you have to be very careful when you are reading your cloud charges yeah whereas since i'm using on azure i have that credit and because of the credit i could provision two machines and one machine i took a very high limit so again the limit in uh, uh, this aws free tier is you will get one cpu and one gb ram whereas if you see on azure i selected two cpu with 8 gb of ram for this windows machine uh sandeep i would drop off you can continue as i have another call to connect okay so okay. you can continue yeah Yes. So, any other questions? Okay. So, this service is configured. I will share with you this URL, and this URL you will be able to see the IS test page. So, this is the last thing that we will take, and then we'll wrap up. If you have any questions? Yes, the community is open, and you can stay back and ask those questions also. I will address them. We have the second session also today, so no worries. You can ask your sessions during that time also. So, this will be a continuation of this session itself. Okay, so this is the local host that I'm accessing. Now, if you go into your browser and you put in this IP address, I'll ping it on the chat also. What is that? Twenty thirty nine. Let's have it over here. Yeah, just put it in the browser. You'll be able to reach the site. This is the last thing that I'm showing you with this session. So you see, within this session itself, I've not only really provisioned a Windows machine, I've also hosted your site. Posted a website and also made it accessible for you to access it from your place. Now, for those people who are going to watch the recording, so this will definitely not be active for you because by the time I will be deleting the VM. But yes, you can follow the same steps as you've seen on the screen. I've done, and you too will be able to configure a VM and access it. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'll take silence as no. So no worries. Uh, if you have any questions, we have the next session and uh, starting at two thirty, we can discuss it at that time. Okay, so all the best for your trainings and see you in the next session. Thank you.